Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Wintergreen Studios Virtual Lit, our bio blitz. You have arrived at the session titled The Humming Birds and the Bees, a Teenager's Step-by-Step -step Guide to Changing the World. My name is Jess Kilo, and I'm the project coordinator at Wintergreen Studios, and I will be your technical support in our session today. And I'd like to pass it over to Brian Scholes, who is a volunteer at Wintergreen, and they will be your video host. Over to you, Brian. I'm here. So welcome to those of you who are joining us. I'm new to the Wintergreen community. Uh, I was very excited to be involved with the BioBlitz when it was live. And unfortunately, like many things, it's gone, it's gone this way. However, I don't know that we'd have Jason with us if it hadn't been this way because he's in Vancouver. So that's very exciting to, uh, to have be able to bring in somebody from so far away who might otherwise have been not available to us. His presentation, the title alone uh, should capture your interest. <laughs> the Hummingbirds and the Bees, a Teenager's Step-by-Step step -by -step Guide to Changing the World. Uh, I did verify that Jason is, in fact, still a teenager, so in it's okay. Yeah. Uh, he's he's a, a Vancouverite, a social entrepreneur who co-founded the Pollinator Project as a freshman in high school. Uh, this organization has formed partnerships with institutions like uh, UBC, University of British Columbia, Simon Fraser Childcare, Earth Save Canada, allowing for the planting of 21 public garden projects and 30 residential green spaces. Jason is here today to speak about the importance of pollinators and his personal experience as a social entrepreneur. Wow, Jason, the screen is yours. <laughs> Brian, thank you so much for your very, very flattering introduction. I'll do my best to live up to it. Um, hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for agreeing to spend your next 45 minutes with me. I really, really appreciate you tuning in. Today in this lecture, we're gonna be talking about how young people, specifically youth that are still in high school, can make a big difference in the environmental issues that they care about. Before I jump into that topic, I'll, I'll introduce um, myself a little bit and some of the work that I do. I run a small organization based out of Vancouver um, called the Pollinator Project Association, and we're entirely youth-led. Our mandate, the reason that we exist, is to save the bees, essentially. And bees play this incredibly important role in our food chain, but they've been dying out at rapid rates in the past couple of decades. So it, it's, it's a cause of concern for people all around the globe. And the reason that we exist is to protect local bees and butterflies by building green spaces in the Metro Vancouver area. So why don't we get, uh, why don't we jump into our origin stories and I'll tell you a little bit about how we get started. A little bit about our origin stories. We started back in 2016. It was a Thanksgiving party that I was attending that my parents were throwing, right? And uh, I had a bunch of my childhood best friends there at the time and it was just super awkward, like dead silence from everyone because we hadn't seen each other in a really, really long time. So we were all hanging out in this room and everyone's trying to start a conversation. We're talking about, you know, the weather, we're talking about books, we're talking about video games, sort of obligatory small top, talk topics. And everyone's trying to generate ideas to start a conversation with. And I remembered that I had recently watched this documentary about how important bees were and the fact that they were dying out at rapid rates. So I blurted out, hey guys, we should try and save the bees. It's sort of a joke. And they did treat it as a joke. It, it was the butt of a joke for some time, but eventually we got talking and it turned into this serious conversation. And eventually the next, the following week after this Thanksgiving party, um, we found ourselves at our first ever board meeting, if you can even call it that at the time. And uh, we, we really, really wanted to make a dent in this pollinator issue, the issue of the bees. So the way that we wanted to do this was by raising $1,000. There was an organization in Vancouver at the time called the EYA, and they have this program where if you donated $1,000 to them, they would build a pollinator garden in your name. So the reason that they build pollinator gardens is because they act as this sort of safe haven for bees and pollinators, and it perpetually gives them a source of food. But at the same time, it gives uh, it allows us to engage the community in the process and raise awareness about this bee issue. So that's what we wanted to do. Eventually, we did raise $1,000, but when we had that cash in our hands, right, we had this briefcase full of cash, and we realized that this program was now outdated. The EYA no longer built pollinator gardens. So we were kind of at a loss um, of ideas for what to do. And one of my co-founders, he said, hey, you know what? Why don't we just build our own pollinator garden? And that was just an absolutely crazy um, idea because we, we've never done anything like this before. Um, but I was like, yeah, you know what? 
the fact that we started this was crazy enough. Why don't we go the extra mile and build our own volunteer garden? So around the same time, um, we got in contact with a journalist named Diane Strandberg, and she was a reporter for the local newspaper. And uh, she caught wind of our story, and she did this article that headlined in the Tri-City News. So that uh, gave us the recognition that we needed that lands in partnerships. And we eventually landed a partnership with the University of British Columbia to fund and construct three of our pollinator gardens at their childcare centers. So this uh, for success, it inspired a lot of other youth to get involved in environmental activism and join us um, at the pollinator project. And with their help, we were able to plant, um, I think the figure was um, 30 green spaces, residential green spaces in the lower mainland and build 20 additional public gardens. So our most recent project, for example, was completed at the Simon Fraser University Daycare Center. And today, um, I wanna say we have around 150 volunteering members that span across two different continents. So we've done a little bit of growing since, um, since our grassroots days. Even though building gardens is our, it's our bread and butter, it's our signature thing, we also branch out into different niches. So we also, we've also embarked on this green space expansion project recently in which with cohorts of volunteers, we would run around these consenting neighborhoods to plant wildflowers to create more habitat for the bees. The reason that we did this is because there's a lot of unused garden space that people have on the properties. And we took advantage of this by turning these um, unused plots of land into beautiful green spaces. So again, to this day, we've been able to plant 30 residential green spaces. But oftentimes we question whether or not what we're doing is the most effective way to help um, local pollinators and to help save the bees. Uh, so we have, we share a lot of uh, conversations with beekeepers and experts and, and professionals and scientists in order to, to come up with better strategies to approach our mandate of saving the bees. And in these conversations, we've come across pretty innovative ways that cities can help save the bees. And uh, we've pitched these ideas to a variety of municipalities like Surrey, like Coquitlam and Port Coquitlam. Um, I'm not gonna talk about these solutions because we're in a bit of a crunch for time, but if you're interested at all in learning more about how you can help save the bees in your everyday life, you can head over to our website at www.thepollinatorproject.info. So that's a little bit about my background and the sort of work that I do. Let's start talking about youth and how young people can get involved in social entrepreneurship. I'll start off by defining the term social entrepreneurship. To me, it's simply the act of assembling together a group of people to address a social or an environmental issue. And today in this presentation, I'll be walking you through a step-by-step -step guide on how you can start your own environmental initiative. Um, first of all, I wanna talk about why there's opportunities for youth out there in the first place. There's three reasons I wanna share with you. Number one is because environmental issues require the attention of the next generation to solve. I believe that any initiative falls flat on its face if it doesn't have a next generation to pass its torch onto. And um, the thing that I always like to say is that it's eventually going to be my generation that inherits planet Earth. And if that's going to happen, we might as well start learning how to take care of the world right now. And that's, that's why environmental issues require the attention of the next generation to solve. The second reason why there's opportunities out there for youth is because age is an attention grabber. Um, people love to hear about young people that are, that are interested in helping out the world, that are interested in making a big positive impact in the world. And the first time that we noticed this is when we were fundraising. We were, we were selling these boxes of Krispy Kreme donuts, right? And our best salesman wasn't me or any of my executive team members. It was one of my friend's little brothers. Um, he was 10 years old at the time. His name was Chance, a super small, scrawny kid. But man, he was just a selling machine. Every single door that he knocked on, we sold boxes of donuts door to door, by the way. So when he would knock on these doors, the people, they would go, oh my God, and welcome him with open arms. It was crazy. It was a sight to see him sell. And, um, you know, he, he was very, very um, underage at the time but he knew the right words to say. And because of that, we caught the attention of the people we were selling to immediately. The reason I suspect why is because even though he's at such a young age, he's managed to attach himself to this higher sense of purpose, which people love to hear about. The third reason why there's opportunities out there for youth is because it's so much easier to create this venture when you're a student, because 
I'm assuming many of students out there don't have a full-time job yet. And so you have that advantage over adults. You don't have as many responsibilities as an adult would. You don't have to pay the bills yet. So you can invest more time and resources into starting up a social enterprise. So now that we've gotten that out of the way, let's talk about my step-by-step -step guide. Step one is to get yourself a team. You need to get yourself a group of like-minded and capable individuals to embark on this journey with you. One piece of advice I have to share with you on getting yourself a team is to get people who complement your personality. So for me, I like to think of myself as somebody who's really, really idealistic and ambitious. So my co-founder, Patrick Zhao, he balances me out perfectly by being pragmatic and realistic. So we sort of deliver this one-two punch. Now that you have your team in place, it's time to come up with some purposes and some objectives. Um, there's a lot of different topics out there that you can try and make a difference in. Whether it, it is you want to try and save the coral reefs, whether you want to make a dent in deforestation, or you want to try and decrease your city's carbon footprint. There's a lot of different ways that you can get involved. Or maybe you want to be like us and you want to help save the bees. It's entirely your prerogative. Um, before I move on, I, I want to discern the difference between an objective and a project. So the objective is the reason that your initiative exists in the first place. Our objective is to save the bees. That's why we exist. But projects, on the other hand, they're the stepping stones that will help you accomplish your purpose. So our projects, for example, uh, are related to building green space in the Metro Vancouver area. So step three, now that you know what you wanna do and you have a team, it's time to start telling people about it. You primarily wanna tell your friends and your family. The reason that you wanna tell your friends is because um, oftentimes they'll get excited about your project with you, right? And that will allow you to essentially create this pool of potential volunteering candidates when you need more manpower to complete your projects in the future. Um, the reason that you want to tell your family members about it is because oftentimes social entrepreneurship can be very, very frustrating. Projects and plans and stakeholders can fall out of place at any given instant. And when that happens, it is really, really nice to have a parent to talk to who knows a little bit more about the real world than you do. So step four, similarly, you wanna get support from your school. You want to get involved, and, and sorry, in contact with a counselor or a principal, or really anyone who knows the ins and outs of your school. The reason that you wanna do this is because they, they know a lot of the resources um, that the school can offer you. Maybe they have this grant that is available to young change makers. Um, the only way that you would know about these programs is if you get in contact with the people who know a little bit about these programs. And I know it seems very, very scary at first when you're um, approaching this figure of authority for the first time. I remember when I was, um, I, when I shared my first conversation with my principal, I was so nervous. I, I was sweaty. Um, it was just an awful time for me. But ever since then, I, I've learned a couple of things about um, reaching out and managing my relationships with people throughout the course of this project. So step five is to have the right mindset. You have to remember that people are, are interested in helping you. Uh, people really want to help young people that are interested in making a change in the world. But that being said, don't be afraid to email anyone and everyone. Because of the invention of the phone and the computer and email, the world is literally at your fingertips. And it, it's, a, it's a very, very powerful networking tool. If you ever see someone in a high position of power, that you admire and that you want to seek advice from, email them. That's the worst thing that can happen is that they don't respond to you. And when that happens, uh, there's plenty of fish out there in the sea. So step six, now that you know a little bit about um, networking, you have to assemble yourself a team of stakeholders and mentors. The reason that you need mentors is because uh, you're still young, right? You don't know everything about the world let alone the issue that you're trying to make a difference in. As a matter of fact, there's nobody out there who knows everything about the world. So that's why you need to seek advice from mentors, from professionals and experts who have already made a difference in the field that you're trying to break into. And mentors, they'll be able to offer you advice, or expert advice on the subject, uh, but they'll also be able to tell whether or not the projects you're invested in is genuinely making a difference in the world. Now, stakeholders. Stakeholders is sort of a buzzword in the world of social entrepreneurship. Um, it basically means any third party individual or organization that is interested in the completion of your project. So oftentimes, 
uh, these people will help you uh, complete your projects. And once you have a team of stakeholders, you essentially have all the means you need uh, to create your projects. So for example, for us, some of our stakeholders are the people who hold the plots of land that we build our gardens in. So now that you know what you wanna do, and you have a team of stakeholders to get you to finish that project, it's time to fundraise and get the capital, the resources that you need to complete the project. There's a lot of different ways that you can fundraise out there. So again, for us, our bread and butter is selling Krispy Kreme donuts. We make a killing off of it. Um, but maybe for you, that might be selling bubble tea or that might be selling celery sticks. You know, there's a lot of different things that work. There isn't really one tried and true formula for everybody. The other thing I would advise you do is to try and get some sponsorships. A lot of companies and organizations won't be able to, to give you money. They won't be able to donate cash to you. But what they can do is connect you with the resources that you need to complete your projects. So for example, one of our biggest sponsors is called West Coast Seeds, and they don't give us a cash donation, but rather what they do is give us the seeds and the flowers that we need to complete our gardening projects. Another one of our um, sponsors is, in, is a company called Unison Windows. Unison is very, very precise about the things that they make. So if they ever have even the tiniest blemish in their wood, they have to scrap the project. They have to toss out the wood. So we approached them and we said, hey, if you have this problem, right? You're trying to get rid of wood and you perpetually have to get rid of wood. Um, so we'll take this wood off your hands and we'll put it to good use. We'll build a pollinator garden off of it. It'll serve a great cause, but at the same time, we'll also promote your company. What do you say? And they said, yes. Um, I think there's a lesson to be learned from this. It's that companies won't advertise their sponsorship opportunities. You sort of have to approach them and negotiate for it. The last way, you can, uh, the last way that you can try and raise capital is by applying for grants and sponsorship. Sorry, applying for grants and funding. It's by far the most efficient way of, of raising capital really, really fast but I wouldn't advise you to do it. It's a, it's a very, very rigorous application process. And at the same time, um, you would be in charge of managing somebody else's money. And that's, that's a stress you don't want when you're just starting out. And especially as a teenager, you don't have a lot of experience balancing budget sheets and, and, and balancing um, income statements. It's a very, very difficult task that requires professional advice. But if that's your, that's your cup of tea, go for it. There, I'm sure there's a lot of um, grants out there specifically designed for young change makers. So now that you have the means of which you're going to create your projects, it's time to get some eyeballs. It's time to turn heads and get the media's attention. Um, the reason that you want to do this is because there might be a lot of members of your community who are, who are interested in helping out with your project. They're interested in donating to you further or interested in volunteering for you eventually. And it's also just a great way for spreading awareness about your cause. My advice to you when you're approaching the media is to use your age to your advantage. As we talked about earlier, people love to hear about young people that want to make a difference. And you can really, really use that to your advantage. You can turn heads just by saying, I'm a teenager and this is a big ambitious goal that I want to connect myself to. And again, don't be afraid to cold call and cold email TV executives and journalists. Um, the way that we got our first media feature was I, I cold called Diane, right? I introduced myself and my project to her and I asked if she would be willing to write an article about me and, and my teammates to get the word out there about our cause and, and about our project. And she said yes. And that one article alone, it, it launched basically our entire career. Uh, donations came flooding in and it gave us uh, the resources that we need and the project leads that we needed uh, to continue the cycle of building pollinator gardens. So now that you've turned a little bit of heads, it's time to create yourself a website so that the people who um, are interested in your project can search you up online. I really like the adage that goes, if you don't exist online, you don't exist at all. And I think that really, really is true for social entrepreneurship. When you're creating a website though, there's two essential things that you need to have on there. Number one is your contact information so people can reach out to you and offer to support you. And you also need information about your projects. Those are the two mandatory things you need on your website. Um, in terms of the tech technical side of creating a website, we personally use the software WordPress because it's super cheap 
And it's the program that our webmasters are the most comfortable with. And I think it creates a really nice looking website as well. But Wix and Weebly are also great alternatives. So now that you have all the moving puzzle pieces in place, it's time to make good on your promises. It's time to lobby that city, to plant those trees, and to build that garden. And once you do so, congratulations, you're now an accomplished social entrepreneur. And before you wrap up, you have to make sure that you thank everybody involved for their help. So that way they can, they're interested in helping you out in the future. And recognition is very, very important for your volunteers. The, ma the vast majority of young volunteers are out there sometimes because they need um, volunteer hours to graduate. And you, you should do your due diligence and give those volunteer hours out there. All it requires is, I think, signing a sheet of paper or, or signing a slip or giving your contact information uh, to them. I know that was a little bit complicated to go through the first time, so I want you to meet Bob. Bob is an inspiring social entrepreneur. He's a high school student, and he really, really wants uh, to raise awareness about deforestation and to decrease his city's carbon footprint. So what I'm gonna do is walk Bob through, through the steps that I just talked to you about. So step one, Bob needs to get himself a team. Uh, he starts talking to some of his friends, asking if they would be willing to embark on this journey with him. And he starts telling his classmates about his goal. And let's say five or six people say, yeah, we would be interested. We would love to help out. And all of a sudden, Bob has an executive team. So now that Bob has a team, they start brainstorming. They know that they want to raise awareness about deforestation, but how are they going to do this? What, what sort of projects are they going to embark on? So eventually after, let's say, one hour of brainstorming, they come up with the idea that they want to plant 100 trees in the Metro Vancouver area. It's a very ambitious goal, but I think a very reasonable one. So now that Bob knows what he wants to do, he starts telling people about it. He tells all his friends and many of his friends get excited for him and offer to volunteer in the future when they're actually planting the trees. Bob also reaches out to his principal and his principal connects Bob with the science teacher that becomes Bob's first mentor. Bob reminds himself that people want to help him out and that he should not be afraid to email anyone and everyone and that the world is at his fingertips. So armed with that mindset, Bob goes out and tries to meet some mentors. He emails a ton of scientists, forestry experts that know a thing or two about deforestation. And he asks if they would be willing to meet him for a cup of coffee and a conversation. Let's say two or three of them agree and uh, they, they start a mentor-mentee relationship. Bob also gets in contact with um, the city of Vancouver and Bob introduces himself. Hey, my name is Bob. This is my project. Um, my teammates and I were let's say 16, 17 years old, and we want to plant 100 trees. Is there any space in Vancouver that we can plant our trees in? And so a couple of weeks later, um, the city reaches out back to Bob and they say, yeah, actually we have this uh, beautiful patch of space in the middle of Stanley Park if you want to go plant there. And Bob says, awesome, we'll do that. So now that Bob knows what he's going to do, he has to fundraise. He has to get those tree saplings that he's going to plant. Uh, let's say he sells a bunch of bubble tea and he makes a killing off of it and he's able to buy 50 tree saplings. But then he goes, oh, wait a second, that's not enough. We were aiming for 100 tree saplings, not 50. So let's start trying to get some sponsors. And he cold calls, let's say, 10 different nurseries in the Vancouver area. And two of them get back to him and are actually interested in uh, Bob's project and offer to sponsor him with a package of 50 tree saplings. Bob puts two and two together and all of a sudden he has 100 trees to plant and he also has that space. So he has everything in place. So now Bob starts campaigning. He starts to get the media's attention. He calls up a local TV executive and he says, hey, my name is Bob. I'm working with a group of six, five or six high school students. And on July 1st, we're gonna go to the middle of Stanley Park and plant 100 trees to raise awareness about deforestation. And then the television executive goes, yeah, actually, we, we have a slot on our morning show tomorrow. Would you be willing to come on and, sharing, uh, and share with our audience a little bit about yourself and, and the work that you want to accomplish? So after Bob turns his heads, he creates a website. And um, some people, there's, there's an outrage, sorry, there's an outpour 
of recognition and of support from the community. And all of a sudden, donations come flooding in and he has more funds than he needs to complete these gardening projects. Now that Bob has all the moving puzzle pieces in place, he makes good on his promises. July 1st, him and a group of 30 volunteers walk into the middle of Stanley Park and start digging and planting trees. And congratulations, Bob is now an accomplished social entrepreneur. So from now on, Bob has two different routes that he can take. He can either go and repeat this process over and over again, this process of planting 100 trees, or he can branch out and do other projects. Maybe he wants to start advising public policy. There's a lot of different options that Bob has now. Bob thanks everybody involved and wraps it up and eats a little bit of cake to celebrate. So that was my example. And of course, in, in real life, it's not always as straightforward as that. And uh, I wanna share with you some of our failures that we've had at the Pollinator Project. Personally, it took us seven months before we were able to secure enough funding for our first pollination garden, pollinator garden, sorry. And our first fundraisers, they were just awful. Our first ever fundraiser, we tried to sell lemon squares. And keep in mind, that we've never baked anything in our entire lives, but we were like, hey, yeah, it's a great idea. We should sell lemon squares. So they came out of the oven tasting super questionable and looking like these ugly SpongeBob figurines, right? And we sold them in this nice suburban neighborhood at around 10 p.m. at night. Everything was dark and we were dressed up like super sketchy teenagers. We were going through puberty and we had acne. It was just a really, really uncomfortable time for both us and our customers. Uh, this other time we ran a video game tournament very nice idea right but the problem was that we only raised 20 dollars but we spent 60 dollars on pizza so all of a sudden we were 40 dollars in the hole and our third ever fundraiser <laughs> um we tried to sell these hoodies we bought 97 dollars worth of hoodies and we sold none <laughs> so by then we were about 150 dollars in the hole but after that we found our vibe with selling Krispy Kreme donuts. And we spent the entire summer months of 2017 selling donuts. I can still smell the glazed donuts, right? It, it's a very, very distinct smell. <laughs> um, so yeah, once we had that $1,000, it took us another four months of networking uh, to land that first partnership with UBC. And even though we had to go through that one year of hell, everything took off after that. Leads started pouring in, donations started pouring in, sponsorships came in and, and i understand we understand that not everybody wants to go through one year of hell and one year of making mistakes in order to start this initiative that might not even work out in the end the reason that we were so successful is because we made so many mistakes but we understand that not everyone can afford to make as many mistakes that we did so what we want to do is offer youth um, a shortcut. We want to empower youth to break through that one year of hell and get started uh, making a difference in the world as soon as possible. The bulk of our start of time was dedicated towards fundraising and networking. And that's true for most social ventures. But because already us at the Pollinator Project, we have established sponsors, resources, project leads, and connections, we want to be able to share all of these tools with young change makers all around Canada and help get them started with their venture. So that's why we're starting the Youth Environmental Empowerment Network. That's the name for the program. So in this program, my executive team and I are gonna be mentoring participants of the program and helping students build their own environmental initiatives. We'll give particip participants all the resources, connections, um, and tools that they need to build gardens, to plant trees, and to lobby governments perform the same projects that we essentially do. There's a bunch of other projects that we can help out with as well. There's, um, I have this brochure if anybody is interested. And um, all participants of this project will be able to serve as official ambassadors of our organization, but they'll also be eligible for a whole host of environmental excellence awards. If there's anyone in the audience at all that's slightly interested or curious about this program, reach out to either me or my colleagues and we can start saving the bees, the trees, and more together. Um, I want you to keep in mind that we're also a not-for-profit organization, so this program is going um, without cost. Before I start the q and I just 
want to remind you that never before has the world been more accessible to young change makers. CEOs, nation leaders, and mentors are just an email away. And all you have to do is to put yourself and your dream out there. And I know it's pretty scary to do for the first time, but that's why we're here to help. And if not us, there's a bunch of other organizations that are looking to empower you. I think that each generation is in many ways defined by its own struggles. And I think the state of our environment seems to be that for my generation. And while it is easy to place the blame on our parents and the parents before them uh, for putting this responsibility onto our laps, that doesn't accomplish anything. It is easy to do that. I advise you instead to take action, whether it be with us or by yourself. Think of this responsibility of fixing the world as an opportunity and not a burden. It's an opportunity to brand ourselves as a generation of heroes and not bystanders. It's an opportunity to brand ourselves as the generation that saved planet Earth. Ladies and gentlemen, it really was a pleasure speaking to you all today. Um, my contact information is all here. You can email me, you can shoot me a text, or you can hit me up on Instagram. I follow back. And um, yeah, so thank you guys so much for sticking around until the end of the lecture. And if you have any questions or you're interested in the program I talked about earlier, you can contact me or I'm sticking around for the next couple of minutes. So um, shoot away your Q&A questions. Wow. <laughs> what an inspirational speaker. I think you should give a TED talk if you haven't already. <laughs> that was really clear. And thank you. That was, I hope it was, it was. Yeah, it was great. It was great. Uh, so we have a few minutes for questions. I've got a, a small list of them here. Uh, and oh, I think sure. you're very qualified to answer. Uh, one <laughs> I from hope Rina. I am. What's that? I hope I am. <laughs> well, I make something up. No, no, you'll be. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know about B City Canada? And are you involved with them at all? Yeah, um, as of last week, I'm actually a board member of B City Canada. Okay. So um, I think back in 2017, when we were first starting out and we launched that first news article that I was talking about, Shelly, who is the CEO, or she's like the president of BCD Canada, she, raised, she reached out to me and she uh, said, hey, we're here if you ever need help. We're also this fledgling organization. Um, we can make it out together and maybe in the future we can work together. So yeah, um, the awards that I was talking about, about um, and the, the Youth Environmental Empowerment Program, we're actually giving out these awards in partnership with B-City Canada. So that's pretty exciting. Okay, thank you. A uh, question from Wes. Who were some of your greatest mentors? Some of my greatest mentors. I remember there was um, this conversation that I shared with, a, with um, it was a scientist named Brian, actually, coincidentally. And um, yeah, we, we shared this breakfast together and he told me all about his philosophy on bees and that, um, he thinks that there's a lot of division in social activists when it comes to the problem of pollinators because some of them are very, very gung-ho and they kind of launch themselves into this, uh, this um, cause without giving a lot of thought into what they should be doing. So um, back then, I think a lot of people, there was a lot of hate towards honeybees and, and people really didn't like honeybees because they thought, saw them as this invasive species that was the root of the pollinator problem. But really what Brian said was that we don't know what the impact of honeybees actually are until we perform empirical experiments about how these honeybees perform in, in, in a system. And I think that really, really opened my eyes and it showed me that I should never really make assumptions uh, when, I'm, when I'm working in this sort of scientific field, right? Because again, I don't know everything about the world and I shouldn't assume that my cause is actually doing good in the world. I should stop and question whether or not what I'm doing is actually beneficial to the world. Very good, responsible answer. Uh, a question from Monica. Can you tell us about the project of which you are most proud? Huh. That's a good question, actually. Let me see. I would have to say the, the green space expansion project that we did because when we're building pollinator gardens, it's quite limited to just one area. And it, it takes a, re a really long time to, to try and assemble the resources that we need uh, for this garden. But with the green space expansion project, uh, 
all of the upkeep and all of the, the raised garden beds and all of the soil was already there. All we needed to do was to plant the flowers and to plant the wildflower seeds. So I think the, the Green Space Expansion Project, it was the one that made the biggest difference. I, know that I have one question. Um, yep. You seem to have accomplished so much at quite a young age. What, what do you think in your childhood directed you to where you are and what you've done? I can think of one specific time. I was in preschool at the time, and um, you know, I was this tiny little four-year-old, and um, I think we had this conversation about water and the future of water with one of my daycare ladies. And then I was like, oh yeah, I can't wait to grow up. And you, you know what she said to me? She, she said this to a four-year-old kid. She's like, when, you're, when you get older, there's not even gonna be water left in the world, <laughs> right? It's to this four-year-old. Like, what? Like, what the hell, man? And wow. that just absolutely traumatized me. And all I could think about for the next couple of years was how the world was gonna end. And, and all I could think of was all of these different environmental problems that I had no control over. So as soon as I got to 14, as soon as I could you know, make a, a minuscule difference in the world, that's when I launched myself at it. So I see it as, um, I think, a bit of a coping mechanism. I feel like I have some sort of control over the world around me. And a positive attitude, <laughs> yeah. inspiration for your, find your good model for your, for your age group. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's been great. And I, I said in my, in my uh, uh, wrap up of the last session, for me as one of the guys passing on the torch, it's so encouraging to see young people of, this, of the eight faces I've seen on the screen, <clears throat> they've all been under 30 and now one under really? 20. So Amazing. the fact that there are young people who are that, that interested and committed to making a difference uh, gives, gives me hope anyways, and I'm sure other people that are in my generation. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just glad I haven't, I'm giving a presentation, but I'm just glad I didn't have to follow you. <laughs> <laughs> tough, act, tough act to follow. Uh, <laughs> and, you and, and your, your approach is such a, such a great mix of idealism, but practical. You know, it's, it's one thing to be idealistic and it's one thing to think nothing can be changed, but you've got a nice blend and a real, really uh, non-threatening way of, of, uh, of proposing that, uh, that, that change can happen and that you guys can make a difference. Uh, my sincere Congratulations on, on what you've done and what you will do in the future. Thank you so much, Jason. And thank you, Brian, for hosting our video session today. Thank you so much for joining us and happy exploring.